Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul McLean, and I'm the MSP for East Lothian. So, welcome to the Scottish Parliament uh, today. This is this is your Parliament, so it's great to see so many of you here uh, this afternoon. So, this is a panel discussion on solving the global cost of living crisis. As a well-being economy, part of the answer, and we'll be discussing that and other topics uh, this afternoon. So, we've got from five o'clock to half past six uh, this evening. This uh, event has been supported by the Cross Party Group on Well-being Economy. I chair the Cross Party Group. On the Belgian economy as well, I've been the cross party group uh, on uh, chair on renewables in the, the, the parliament as well, and also the international development cross party group in the Scottish parliament as well. So we're looking at, at the uh, Belgian economy, but also looking in the wider context in terms of international development. So I'll introduce our panelists in, in a little second um, and give a little bit more, a bit more breakdown about what the event's going to uh, involve uh, this afternoon. So I'm going to introduce our, our panelists. So our first panelist, I'll ask, uh, is Gemma, uh, is, uh, is it far right there? Gemma um, is a proactive political economist. <laughs> uh, no. No, no political economist. Uh, far right there. Uh, cheers. My, I can't possibly say that. As a political, uh, political economist, systems change specialist dedicated to transforming the economy, to set society and the environment. She's a trustee of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance in Scotland and a senior fellow at the Financial Innovation Lab. Jane has a PhD in diverse economies and has published on transferring uh, banking and finance. We've got Tabuli Chittendam who's joining us on, uh, online and she's joining us from South Africa. So Tabuli is the network colleague of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, a community builder and non-profit leader with a passion for social and creative entrepreneurship. She graduated from the Gordon Institute of Business Science Social Entrepreneurship Programme. She also leads community organisation Makers Valley Partnership, which enables the wellbeing economy in the eastern outskirts of Johannesburg's inner city, and I said to the leader in this front of that. So it's great to see you this afternoon. And at least we're able to see you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, to my right here is, is Miriam Brett. Miriam is a researcher and a political economist. She's currently a research fellow at the Democracy Collaborative and Melbourne Economy Alliance, a board member of the Green New Deal Rising, and sits on the expert panel for the North Ayrshire Community Wealth Building <coughs> Strategy. So it's great to see everybody here this afternoon. The cost of living crisis is probably the biggest issue that every politician is facing at, at the moment. But it's also important around about how we can make sure that we transform what we're trying to do in terms of cost of living. It's not short term change, but the longer term change that, that we need. And that's incredibly important. And one of the main reasons around about setting up the cross part group for the developing economy. For me, one of the main reasons is we can't continue to, to, to uh, measure economic development purely by GDP. That, that, that can't go on. We need to move on from that. We need other members to look at that, and that's one of the key things in the cross party that's been discussed. And we've had various other cross party groups in the panel before. We've had representation from Holland and other parts of the, the, as well. As, so it's great to see this. This is the world issue. It's something we all need to change. It's not just one issue for Scotland, it needs to change the world in, in terms of that. So I'm going to open up um, a little bit in the first question, and I'm going to open up in the first question. In, in, in that regard, um, and it's going to be talking then about, I'm going to get this first question, um, just give it a second. In terms of the cost of living crisis, um, what can we do to cost the tackle of the cost of living crisis in Scotland and globally at the moment? So I'm going to probably open up to uh, Gemma at the moment, and then I'll come across to uh, Tobley, and then Maria. Uh, Great, thank you all very much. Uh, nice to see you all here, including you might have seen my excitement. Oh my gosh, because I've been working with Wheel Scotland now for what, maybe two and a half years. Um, and it's the first time I've seen people in real life, so um, I'm a bit exciting. Um, but what have we been doing for, the, for, for those sort of two and a half years in Wheel Scotland? Um, and not just from then, but before then. You know, a lot of people have spent a lot of time for many, many years um, not warning about the explicit moment that we're in. Um, but saying that there is a better way. So people have been calling for action on climate change for 30, 40 years. Um, I, when I, when I counted as a youth, which sadly is no more, um, I went to COP15 um, in 2009 in Copenhagen, and that was <laughs> um, pre-COP26. That was the last chance to kind of get one to five to be, you know, to, 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 to still be um, the goal. And uh, as we saw, like we're still not, still not doing it. So 16 years later, um, and when, when, when I went to COP, when I, you know, the global youth came from all over the world. So the the sort of UK youth delegation, we partnered with the Kenyan youth delegation. So we fundraised to kind of make sure they could come over, you know, getting them in the room with the English 
um, and the, the UK politicians um, and the negotiating teams to try and really kind of be allies and, and, and raise up the you know, real threats that you know are there, particularly for the whole of South facing the worst ones of this crisis. Um, and as, as sadly, I think that the current situation is our inaction is coming home to roost here for the first time um, in a really very real and visceral way. And you know, I. I don't think it's been alarmist to say that there is really such a frightening time ahead in the UK in terms of people's, you know, can we just think about that question, that, that, that term, the cost of living crisis, the cost of living, we're not talking about the cost of enjoying your life, we're not talking about the cost of sitting up and putting your feet up, the cost of not being able to go on holiday. We're literally talking about people's capacity to live and to live, you know, we're not even saying live well in this scenario. We're, we're talking about a situation where in Scotland, there is already a problem with fuel poverty. About 20% of the population are affected by fuel poverty. That's expected to rise to 60% in the coming months ahead. You know the, the the cost of living, you know the, the cost of fuel on its own is going up. Um, what was it from one thousand? Um, I've lost it. It's on the sheet somewhere. But it, it, it's going up to possibly four thousand two hundred and sixty-six. I think it is in January. That's insane. Like you know, regular people who have good, well-paid jobs and maybe who haven't got a lot of debt are going to feel the push and everybody who is underneath that are really going to struggle. But I think the point is, is it is wholly preventable had we taken action 40 years ago, had we taken action 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, last year, now we're still waiting for, for sort of real significant action, at least from the, the UK government. Um, although there's a lot of great stuff in terms of the heat and building strategy, which I think we'll get onto later in terms of Scotland specific action. But a well being economy in terms of the cost of living means that we need to just call out the fact that this is a crisis about surviving, about people just being able to heat their houses, not freeze to death, or conversely, like, like cook to death in the heat waves. Like it, it, it works on both sides of this, um, and what we really need to do is say this is really enough. Like the, the, the things that we need to do to tackle the cost of living, are the things we need to do to tackle climate change, are the things we need to do to tackle inequality, are the things we need to do to create good jobs for people, um, and and to sort of push away from the cost of living and push into living well, living joyous, happy lives, which is all anybody, you know, really, really wants to do. So I think we are in a very dire situation and, you know, I think this is going to be a really good discussion to try and tease out, you know, hopefully some positive actions and a positive path forward from the cost of living crisis into the wellbeing economy. Well, thank you for that. I'm going to bring totally in in a minute. Can you it might have the point that Jim has made about the Mormons, and I, I don't know if, if, if this was fake. Last night was going through Twitter, and in 1986, Carl Sagan gave evidence to the American Senate talking about climate change and the dangers of climate change in 1986. He was like, no, imagine if we'd been listening to them, and politicians have listened to them, because we've been things now. So, totally, I'm going to bring yourself in, in, in terms of what, you know, the cost of the crisis, how that's impacting on, on, on South Africa in terms of the well being economy and the impact it can have on South Africa. Exactly. Yeah, uh, Jim, I just resonated so much with what you're saying because just that question, living wage, just, you know, something I've been thinking about so much is that this is a human rights crisis. It really is fundamentally an attack or, you know, impacting our human rights as a society. And especially us as Africans are really feeling the impacts of this. So obviously with the war and the pandemic, all of these have had a huge deepening economic crisis and just an effect on livelihoods in Southern Africa specifically. We've seen extreme poverty just increase by I think it was 55 million people in 2020 and then a further 35.5 uh, 35 million people lost their jobs in addition to that in 2020 alone. And the job, the unemployment rate in South Africa, for example, in, amongst our youth, is up to 63%. And so there's so many things that like this is 
really affecting our access to basic goods, basic services, our food, our housing, our healthcare, our access to electricity. There is so many um, fundamental basic things that are being impacted by this. And this is why I see it as such an important thing to, to have this discussion around today. Um, but further than that, I also see unrest, civil unrest rising, protest rising, social friction, the inequalities are increasing. And so this is just, um, you know, in terms of the social fabric, not even just access to human rights, the social fabric of our country, of our continent, is really being impacted by this as well. And so this is, you know, obviously, as you mentioned, the well-being economy is a long, long, long awaited and overdue. Um, but even more so at this present moment. So I think this really highlights to our society, to communities, that where is this sense of Ubuntu when you know big fossil fuel companies are taking advantage of this crisis situation and further increasing prices? How do we bring the spirit of Ubuntu, which is just togetherness, of actually recognizing humanity and recognizing one another? Um, and I really think the well-being economy ties into this. And so I come from Johannesburg, South Africa, as mentioned, and one of the communities that I've been actively involved in is called the Makers Valley. And we've really looked to the well-being economy, especially during COVID, at the, the brink of COVID. We really looked to some of the approaches and looking at a local economy and community wealth building and some of the solutions that lie within this um, you know, global kind of narrative, how can it be localized and contextualized for our demographic? And it's been really interesting to see some of the solutions that have come up from this, looking to well-being economy frameworks and approaches, but actually making it resonate with our local community. So I just love the fact that the well-being economy has really always emphasized that we need social justice on a healthy planet. And this really goes back to this conversation, is that how can we ensure that there is justice for people and planet? And I think the wellbeing economy provides a lot of answers to this. Well, thank you for that. And I think what one of the issues we'll be touching on later on is the, is the global need for change, not just country by country, but that global need. So I'm going to bring in uh, Miriam uh, and just answer the same question. One key thing I think for me today to get across is we want to see this participatory as possible. So if you do have a question, we've got roving mics up the back there, please put your hand up or a comment to make, we'll bring you in. I've got a list of suggested questions, but we're open to the policy for the, for the floor to make any questions. So please feel free to participate. This is a two-way process and things like that. Miriam, just on the, the first question. Fantastic. And um, well, it's brilliant to be here and intimidating the fantastic comments to be on. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I think the cost of living crisis has exposed really deep set fractures and fault lines throughout the heart of our economy and really driven forward the need for an economic systems change um, approach. You know, we're seeing a perfect storm gap and we're seeing high water and profits from fossil fuel capital. We're seeing soaring rates of fuel poverty, folk forced to choose between heating their homes and putting food on the table. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and so it really kind of encapsulates a lot of the essence of some of the kind of fundamental fault lines of the way in which the economy is owned and the way in which the economy operates. Um, and intrinsically tied to the cost of living crisis is the volatility of the current operation of fossil fuel capital. And it can't, we can't see those as, as, um, a, as separate. Um, and tackling it, and the question was, was about how do we tackle that at an international level, at a Scotland level, at UK, at UK level as well. Um, I, I think at an international level, there's there's huge amounts that, that we can do to begin to tackle this. Looking at the kind of, of course, the causes and distributional consequences of, of climate breakdown, which are inherently tied to the cost of living crisis, are unequal, are, and the, the distributional effects are, are unevenly felt. Um, and those that have contributed least towards the climate crisis are at the front line of climate breakdown. Um, and that's, you know, fundamentally unjust and indicative of, of an economy that is, that is unequal by design. Um, and, and so what action could be taken to address that? Well, I think, firstly, in terms of Scotland's place in this, you know, as, as an oil and gas hub, um, there's a huge amounts that we can do to actually accelerate that transition. Scotland, you're finally our appalling weather, today exempt, has a benefit. You know, we've got incredible wind and wave power, we've got incredible renewable potential. 
So our job to accelerate that renewable transition is part of a just transition that you know, creates good, green, unionised jobs um, throughout the country um, is integral to actually a bigger kind of conversation around, around wider decarbonisation strategy. The role that we can play, and granted there are limitations to this because of the nature of what is devolved and what is not, but there's normative power in pushing for debt relief, for debt restructuring, for debt cancellation, which the UK frankly has an appalling track record of doing. There's action we can take, um, again, at a normative level, to look to making trading just and um, by design to actually try and alleviate some of the pressure um, on countries in the global south and tackle international um, uh, the, the way in which the economy is designed to exacerbate global imbalances um, like for example the abolition of the energy charter treaty which uh, enables countries um, uh, enables companies to sue countries um, that seek to transition um, to renewable energy so we're seeing European, sometimes UK based oil and gas companies, for example, suing governments in the global south, mid low and middle income governments, for attempting to, to accelerate their transitions. Um, and last but by no means least, I think we need to have a very serious conversation about climate reparations and what that means for the global south, what that means to tackling those deep set global um, imbalances in the international economy. And at a UK level, I just want to speak specifically on energy just now. Um, Throughout um, my work, I carried out research specifically looking at the ownership of um, uh, our energy systems. And we've had some uh, very stark findings. So over the past 10 years, big six energy companies paid out almost £23 billion pound in dividends. That is six times their tax bill. Now, if we look to France, for instance, the French government um, forced EDF, the uh, uh, national energy company, to cap wholesale energy price rises to 4% and then they nationalise the company. That was done to tackle uh, the cost of living crisis and as a result, we aren't seeing the levels of fuel poverty spikes that we in France, that we are in, here in Scotland, which of course, you know, is, I'm, I'm from the Shetland Islands, it doesn't get much further north than that in the UK, it's very, very cold. Um, and so, you know, Scotland is uniquely vulnerable to the upcoming winter. Um, and the notion is, is almost kind of so ingrained in it, and I think this taps into the need to just completely and fundamentally rewire the economy to, to focus on delivering for the public good, on delivering and, and aligning its goals to sustainability, to equity, to justice. Um, so hardwired is our approach to kind of deepening marketisation in the economy that I think we have a kind of exceptionalist perspective there. We need to take a step right back from that and look around us to what other countries are doing, what's the norm in other countries, and recognise that public ownership of energy um, can help us deliver a just transition, it can create better value for, for, for consumers, it, you know, it ensures that elements can be reinvested in those services and reinvested in households as opposed to extracted to shareholders and executive pay um, and can help to create more and better paid um, jobs throughout the country as well. So there's just, uh, I mean, there's 101 things to talk about. We need to tax profits, we need, we need a green industrial strategy, we need a new deal for workers, um, and I think we'll go along to speak about um, Scotland's specific examples shortly. But the, this should be a wake up call. This is a perfect storm, and it should be a wake up call to fundamentally rewire the, the ownership and operations of it. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm going to come back, and of course, I mentioned at the start about the, the title of the, the discussion. Solving the, crisis, uh, solving the global cost of living crisis is a well being economy part of the answer. When, when I first came into the Parliament, speech after speech after speech mentioned we need to move to a well being economy. And I thought, right, I'm going to ask some of my colleagues, what does a well being economy actually mean to you? There were, there were as many different answers as, as the questions that were asked. So I'm, I'm probably trying to put the panel on the spot in terms of that, and I'm going to ask them to keep it brief for you. But in terms of, I'm really keen to understand from the audience what they think, what you think a well-being economy is. Because I think one of the key things we also need to do as a country is how do we measure what a well-being economy is. That's part of it, and we're obviously policy behind that. So I'll probably really come to yourself, um, Jenna, in terms of that. What is a well-being economy to you? You touched on it, but what, what does it mean to you? What does a well-being economy mean to you? Yeah, so, the, it does four things. 
So, um, Wheel Scotland have produced a lovely short brief strategy. So, even if you don't feel like you understand economics, even if you, you might, you know, a lot of people feel intimidated by that, um, that's not what we're about. Um, it's about really pulling it down. And we've got this fantastic strategy, and there's, there's sort of four things that, that a wellbeing economy is involved. So, the four P's, because everyone likes alliteration. Um, so, we've got purpose. So. There should be guiding principle, um, guiding principles to create a well-being economy, and that should drive what businesses do. It should drive what policy does. It should drive, you know, how people are able to make decisions about their own lives, and um, to um, enable the, those kind of principles of a well-being economy. The second thing is prevention. So this is about, you know, we spend so much money. Have another great report in Wales, Scotland, and um, which Anna, one of the authors, has sat, sat right in the front row here. Um, called failure demand, and what that did was look at how um, how much money we spend just fixing up the messes that the current economy creates. Now, you know, even if you're not kind of the most sort of right wing Tory, and you, you know, everybody hates inefficiencies like that. Like, what, why are we spending so much money having people come to harm and then sort of trying to fix it a little bit, maybe not quite perfectly afterwards. What we need to do is do, do preventative measures. So that means um, you know, tackling the root causes. So we, we often say like moving upstream to sort of stop the floods from happening in the first place. Um, the third P is um, pre-distribution. So this is again about preventing gross inequalities in the first place. So this would be about people getting paid a fair wage, not taxing or not taxing the owners of that wealth later to give things back in tax credits. It's about giving people who create the value in the first place a fair share of that value in the first place. So, um, you know, there's lots of examples in Scotland of community-owned businesses um, and, and um, employee-owned businesses and co-ops and there's loads and loads of fantastic models that we already have, that's already part of our economy now, but what we need to do is scale that up and make it much more real. And then the final P is people power. And so, you know, people need to have the choices available to them and feel like they can be in control of their lives. And I think people are just kind of on a raft being washed adrift and um, not being able to take control and ownership and freedom for, for themselves in, in, in their own lives in that way. So people need to say whether it's in democracy, so democracy needs to very, very strongly be strengthened because it's it's at quite a lot of risk at the moment, both here and across the world. Um, you know, if anyone followed the um, the January six sort of things that we've done in America, like we are really short steps away from quite a terrifying situation sometimes. Um, but so in, to counter that, people have to have meaningful roles in work, in politics, in businesses, in the communities to be able to shape the future that they need. So, all these, that's yeah, I'm going to come to Mary and then talk about bringing yourself into that. How do I follow the four P's? <laughs> Difficult. Um, okay, um, I think just to add to that rather than attempt to follow on from it. Um, is that it, it's about realigning our values system of what the economy is meant to do, what it's meant to deliver, and who it's meant to deliver for. Um, our economy is meant to give us the necessities and more to life, right? It's about warm, safe, affordable homes, it's about access, you know, affordable, accessible food, it's about delivering good wages, good conditions for jobs, um, and it should actively root out the entrenched inequalities in our society. It should um, put us on a path to a sustainable future for future generations to enjoy. That should be what the economy is there to do. And instead of measuring it in that way, we encapsulate it through uh, these very, very narrow fiscal metric systems that fail to actually accommodate the nuances and the complexities and the goals and the values that we actually want to seek. And GDP in particular um, is intrinsic to the way in which we do this and we centre the entire economy around it. And we have done for decades and it's bonkers. <laughs> you know, and it doesn't actually assess you know, rates of decarbonisation. It doesn't actually assess how sustainable our economies are, the qualities of those jobs, the levels of inequality in society, all of these things that are intrinsic to how the economy functions and how it delivers for us and who it delivers for and why. Um, and I, I think just to, to end by saying that, you know, and, and I was guilty of this as well, I used to say the economy is broken, 
and because it is literally what it is. Um, but it isn't in many ways, so it's doing exactly what it was designed to do. The type of economy that we have, and it, there's nothing natural or inevitable about the type of economy that we have today. And we've changed it in many ways before. We can look to the post-war consensus and the way in which we had a dramatic shift of values, the levels of investment we saw to restructure and rebuild an economy out of the wreckage, and we can look to a very different type of transition under the thatcher Reagan years, in which we saw a, you know, I'd argue, a devastating um, but radical transformation of the economy. There is nothing natural or inevitable about the way the economy is currently geared. Who owns, who owns the economy and in, in whose interest does it run? And we have the power to change that and put centering the well-being economy at the very heart of that is a, a really important foundational step to do so. Thank you for that. your thoughts on what we're doing on this? Then I'm going to put it sure. out so if anybody <laughs> wants to come and please put your hand up after this and then I'll, I'll, I'll bring the lady just there, what does the well-being economy mean to you? But totally put yourself out of all. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, it's very hard to add to what they've just said. I think really encompasses what Wellbeing Alliance is, is advocating for. Um, and I think, yeah, we're singing from the same hymn sheet. So what I would just say, something that I think has personally been important for me, is that the Wellbeing Economy is also about diversity of thought. It is about plurality, it is about inclusivity, because it's not a one size fits all. And when we think about local context and moving away or you know, the this, this spirit of decolonization and looking to various parts of the world and what resonates and what works in a local context, it's so important that indigenous knowledge is brought to the forefront as well and that the voices, and this is the thing about the wellbeing economy, it's that it's every voice is valid in the room. It's not a certain group of people. Actually, it's all encompassing. And this is the thing, is that the economy is, it's exciting because now everybody has a say. It's a management of how we live our lives. It's a management of how we engage with one another. And so this is what I love about the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. And even the approach that we have is not just about the outcome or the tool that we're trying to create. It really is also about the design or the process of how we get there. So we look a lot at the co-creation and participatory processes because the, the process of getting to the outcome is just as important as the outcome. So that's what I would add. I'm going to open up to the audience and the first hand up there is today. What does the Wellbeing Economy mean to yourself? Was that a question or a comment? Okay, well first of all, thank you. Um, I'd like to know how this fits in with the environment. I mean, Obviously, the economy is having a terrible effect on the environment, and I'd like to know how this well-being economy uh, links with the donut with donut economics, which you know looks at the limits to growth in terms of its impact on the environment. Thanks. Now, is there any other questions? I'm going to be taking one or two questions. I'm going to take the lady just in the front there and the lady at the back. I'm going to take a couple of questions at a time. So, if the panelists can take a note of that one, and then just the lady at the front there. Yeah. Um, I'm from Scotland's International Development Alliance. I'm interested in the fact that obviously there's consensus in the room and in South Africa. But actually, at a global level, if you look at the draft statement from the High Level uh, Political Forum, which is all the governments in the world talking about the Sustainable Development Goals, hidden in those 29 pages is a commitment to getting rid of GDP as a, as a way of measuring economies and moving to the well-being economy. So, okay. We have 163 countries signed up to it, we have everybody in this room. I don't have a sense though that it's going to happen, so I'd like to know how we do it. Do we need to glue ourselves to the world? Well, hold that question because what I was going to do is have a specific, ask a specifically on the point you made and end in there, so yeah, we'll, we'll come across to that one. And the lady at the, the back there. Thank you. Um, mine is actually really linked to the previous speakers that um, I. It's maybe not a question, more of a comment, uh, and also something I'm thinking and grappling with myself is that I heard the point made earlier about our fixation with, you know, having fiscal metrics to measure everything like GDP and so on. Now, wrong or right, um, we do need to have some sort of fiscal indication of measuring how well we're doing. Now, if we are to then expand it to more inclusive sort of well-being type of indicators, 
my sort of question is, what would that look like, considering that in every different country, whether you're in Scotland, you're in South Africa, there are nuances and subtleties to everyone's sense of what is their well-being. So if we think of it on a sort of global macro point of view, it can get a bit tricky in terms of how we measure it. And again, we may not want to fixate on measuring it, but there is a school of thought that what gets measured gets done. So there does need to be some aspect of it. So it's not really a question, just more of a comment on some of the difficulties um, and practical strategies to think about as we push forward for the well-being economy. I'll ask the panel to come in and talk a little bit about the point that we the the economics. So, Jim, I'll probably come to yourself, uh, then and then, and then to the then million. And I think there's been, I would like to move on to the point you made about international development and how we can and the connect to that, because I think that's incredibly important. So, uh, Jim, I'll ask you on the point that was made by the lady, the first, first question. Yeah, sure, and I, I think it, it sort of picks up on the, the point that Zobaloo was making about there's a diversity of approaches in here. You know, from donor economics is fully part of the, that well-being story. It's fantastic to see how that's getting picked up and done on a local level or you know, in loads of different places across the world. But I think that the ultimate beauty of the donor is just this, it's the simplicity of that idea that there is like an ecological ceiling that we can't go above and a social floor that we can't go below. And I think that the, the simplicity of that, you, you know, I, could, I always test everything by whether I could explain it to my mum and dad, right? So like, my, my dad was a bricklayer, my mum worked in macro, I'm getting more Geordie when I'm saying my mum and dad. <laughs> and, um, and you know, and it's, it's, can I explain that to them? And you know, okay, my, I might say something other than social support, you know, see it. But, but they would get the, the, the point of what I was saying, that you know, at some point there has to be limits to the way that we interact with each other, the way we interact with the world. Um, that is sort of fair and just, and you know there is no future without rescuing. Is probably not the correct term, but rescuing the state that the environment is in and that our current trajectory is is, is doing to us now and taking us to in the future. So it's it's absolutely fundamental, and you know the things that we need to do. It's about marrying that. You know, it's almost like the environmental thing comes first because we all rest upon it, but it will not get done unless the social aspect, um, that Thumbler was also saying in her introductory remarks, is part of that. It has to be a just transition. Otherwise, it, it, it can't happen. It, those two things have to fundamentally come together. So, yeah. yeah well, I mean, I, I, the same question, obviously, you know, is the environment seen as, as an important issue in, in South Africa? Is it probably here because it's obviously we're facing climate change emergency, but it's also a, a, a biodiversity emergency and so on. So, um, um, what, what, how is that looked upon in South Africa? So, yeah, it's a difficult one because they are so linked, and, and I think I'm just adding to what everybody said is that in South Africa, we can't speak about climate justice, we're not speaking about social justice. If you haven't been able to feed your child, um, and this is the majority of our community is that the inequality is just frightening and the social um yeah the, the the social protection for south africans or africa i think it's at 17 percent in terms of social protection the the globe comparison is 47 percent so it's really really difficult to speak about climate justice we're not speaking about social justice but the narrative that we really emphasizing is that they go hand in hand they they are linked Climate justice without social justice, social justice without climate justice, you can't do either. And I think it is really important to actually build knowledge and narrative around this, especially now with the COP27 being in Africa this year. Um, because African leaders, we were just discussing this with the team um, yesterday, is that there is the sense that African leaders are coming forward to say, actually, we are really burdened by the socioeconomic state of our countries as a continent and we are going to be looking at the fossil res uh, fuel reserves that we have and we're going to be exploring that to kind of to <laughs> alleviate the social pressures that we are facing and so there is a um, real urgency in terms of addressing or assisting and i think um you were speaking earlier about foreign aid or debt alleviation specifically for african countries if there's enhanced liquidity and really recognizing the burden from a social point of view for African countries that could really kind of assist in terms of having a, 
a more open approach towards the kind of justice work that needs to be done. And so I say it as, you know, I'm really, it's a sore issue. Just in a practical example, in our community in Lakers Valley, we started this local currency um, that rewards people in our community for recycling, but gives them access to surplus food. And there's a whole model around this that's been really successful, and it's a digital currency, and it's really worked. But the, the actual value of that, we would still say we're struggling as a community for people to see waste as value, to see that the recycling work that they're doing is actually benefiting them in the long run. They are really just seeing the immediate um, you know, response in terms of access to food as a thing that they're working towards. So the climate justice or the recycling initiative or the environment part is, is great and it's a nice to have, but I would say on a, on a community and grassroots level, it's a really hard sell. And so this is why we're really passionate about combining the two narratives together. And that's an issue I want to touch on. We'll touch on the global impact, but I want to touch on what local communities can do as well. So that we can just move on to the next question. But I'm just on the, on the, 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 the point the first lady made about donor economics. I'd like just your thoughts on, on that. Then I want to talk about the global context and international development and the importance of that. So I'm going to start the donor yeah, I'd say, um, and Jeff covered it um, really well, but I mean, I'd say as well on on that point around kind of the need to kind of because it ties into the point that, you, that yourself have made around around the need to kind of replace it with something else. We can't just not measure the, the way the economy operates. Now there are kind of a series of indicators that we could look to that would be kind of universally. Um, better, whatever you are in the world, to try and measure um, how successful, what success in an economy looks like, that could be from child poverty reduction, rates of decarbonisation, the quality of jobs that we have in an economy, to give a few examples of the many that could be, but also just to add to that, that there's a real need to shift away, the climate and environmental crises changes absolutely everything, um, the need for urgent and radical action is very, very clear. We have a, a literal deadline in front of us and a 1.5 target to get to. So the need for, for urgent and radical action is very clear. Within that too, I think there needs to be a way in which we reframe um, public policy decisions, decisions around investment and, and the um, duration with which we expect to see returns, because that's sometimes how it's seen, right? There's a very, very short-termist approach to the way in which decisions are taken. Um, and, and how we measure those decisions is, is um, linked to that. So, you know, we need to reframe our, our minds out of that and, and kind of rewire our approach to public policy to try and tackle climate and environmental crises in a way that actually you know, is consistent with long-term planning, which is something we haven't done for, for decades and decades and decades, generally, at a UK level, certainly. Um, that actually kind of shifts away from the, the short-termist thinking because it, it's simply not applicable to an age of climate and environmental breakdown. Uh, thank you for that. I, I want to now move on to the two points we made by last two speakers. I was talking about um, international value being incredibly important at this, and, and, and I suppose it, it, it's, it's global value, which is, I think is incredibly important. And I think at the moment a lot of the cost of interest is probably driven by geopolitical issues that are going on, obviously, the, the war in, in Ukraine has obviously uh, had an impact on that, the impact of gas, and we'll talk, we can maybe talk about energy security later on because I think that's incredibly important uh, in terms of that. I think there's another couple of instances when you look at it. COP26 last year, we talked about the big, massive group of countries in terms of the US. China and India, and they have a lot of to move to quicker measures to get us down to 1.5. And we just have to look at the pandemic in terms of how quickly or how poorly the, the North, the relatively rich North, tried to support a uh, uh, vaccination in, in the, 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 the poorer South. So that again is an issue about that. So I'm going to open it up to the panel in terms of the importance of international development and global well being. Where we can play a part, and I think the lady that mentioned about the indicator of what we need to do globally to move us towards that. Do we almost need something similar to COP26 in terms of moving towards a what's a global well being and how do we move together on that? So, Toby, I'm going to probably come to yourself on that one first of all, and then, then I'll go to uh, William and then Jim. Sure. Um, 
So yeah, I do obviously global well-being is important and I, I like somebody in the panel said what does that mean though for <laughs> the various countries because it is going to look different in each country and I think that's the, like that's one of the starting points is if we had a platform to discuss what global well-being looks like I think that would be crucial in terms of hearing the voice of the majority world which is often so left out in terms of these conversations and these platforms and these dialogues is that that is such a crucial first step in terms of examining what is the, the development that we're wanting to do if you know we have to hear the voices of these countries first. Um, but I think I was alluding to the fact that just now was speaking about <clears throat> yeah, this, this socio-economic pressure that African leaders are facing and, and how can international or the global um, the globe just kind of assess and input and provide assistance in terms of these. So you, sp you spoke about vaccination relief, which was absolutely incredible um, for specifically Africa and what that meant in terms of us fighting this pandemic. Um, but there's so many other ways that this can be done. And I think specifically in terms of data deviation and enhanced liquidity for these countries, because this is really where the biggest struggle is. Um, I think that's that's a big step for us. Um, obviously, I'm speaking from an African perspective, so this is really what's crucial for us. But <clears throat> from a global perspective, I really feel that yeah, a conversation where everybody's got a seat at the table would be really meaningful, specifically for Africans, um, to feel that their voice is not only heard but it's valid and will be taken into consideration. And even um, this narrative around African leaders now saying. They're going to explore fossil fuel reserves, and there's a quick no way from the global audience like that's wrong. That just goes against everything that we've been working for for climate change. That response within itself has has become has been seen in a, ne a negative light in terms of an African perspective because it's seen again as a sense of colonization. And so <clears throat> I think it's it's about really just having this conversation but really valuing the knowledge that these African countries or majority world countries can bring before we push solutions um, you know, and, and try to, to access or to, to go on this path of development without actually recognizing what are the actual needs and why. Just on that, I suppose one question that was, that was mentioned by the second speaker there was around about the need globally to move towards the Belgian economy. How, how do we get agreement on that as much or as closely as, as possible. And one of the key things I think for me when you're talking about the, a broken system, we've got governments moving towards spending three, four, five percent of their GDP on defence spending. And we've got the current government here in the UK cutting their 0.7% uh, budget for international development. There's something fundamentally wrong when we're looking at, at that internationally. So I don't know your thoughts on in terms of how do we move the world globally towards the Belgian economy, how did we get 100 million, I mentioned about 160 million How did we get agreement on that as out there? And I know the Belgian Alliance has talked about before as well as like, in terms of for speakers from New Zealand, for speakers from Holland, or the South 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 Africa. So it's, it's, it's an issue that's been raised by the How do we move towards it as a more action from governments that need to be done? In, uh, so I don't know if you have thoughts on that, and I'll obviously ask my own idea on that as well. But I know what your thoughts are on that point that was raised by the speaker. Yeah, so completely agree that there's, you know, the Building Economy Alliance is, is one of our biggest strategies is the WECO partnership. And this is where we already have five governments, national governments, working with Building Economy approaches and frameworks. And part of our 2040 strategy is to enhance the number of governments that are looking to Building Economy frameworks and approaches. And what we see actually is interesting that there is an interest and what this means for national governments. I'm just hearing an echo of myself, so. <laughs> but what this means for national governments, this has been, there's interest in terms of this, and what we see at a societal level, and again, I go back to my grassroots activism stance, is that, you know, this failure demand of society saying, something is not right. This economy is not working for us. And so from the ground up, we seen pressure on governments nationally and locally. We started. We've got a, a 
a thing that's called the Policy Makers Network, which are local governments across the world that are connecting and sharing knowledge and understanding how can I use well-being economy in my context and getting learnings from one another globally, which is also growing. In South Africa, for example, we're seeing cities really getting you know, in contact with us, asking us how we can be part of this network. So I think the interest is there. It's just about the support and the networking and providing the resources or the steps and the guides in order to implement it. And so at a local level, we've worked on for local government policy design guide, which is co-created by over 70 members um, within the Wellbeing Economy Alliance that is being piloted in various areas. Um, and this has been really fruitful in terms of, because of the, the plurality of thought and perspective, but also we realizing that the way that it's being piloted is obviously looking different. The outcomes are not exactly the same. It's looking, you know, the nuances are there. And so even though they're working from one policy design guide, we are flexible and open to the fact that this is not going to look exactly the same across the globe. But actually, that's a, that's a great thing. It's not going to. And so I think it's, it's about this ground up kind of activism and movement around people saying we want something better, this is not working for us, and we're starting to see that, but also from national and local government policy makers actually being part of this, providing them with the support, the tools, the resources in order to implement them in their, in their obviously, in their context. I think we'll probably move on to work with local communities and local authorities can play their part. Um, but I, the point, obviously, Miriam just obviously the point that they're doing that, but the global will be, you know, how important is that in terms of international development? But should we also be measuring our contribution to global well being? We've talked about how we measure our contribution to the well economy in Scotland. Should we be measuring our contribution to the global well being as well? So I don't know what your thoughts on that. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a really, really interesting, um, interesting idea. Um, and um, I mean, I think just on COP26, first I think it was a really um, important moment for, for Scotland, the Scottish Government, um, to, we saw the First Minister come out against the creation of Campbell Oil Fields. Um, that felt massive. Um, I think that's a, a really kind of seismic shift. And we've got, we've got a lot further to go, but, um, but I think, you know, taking steps to talk about not just about like you know we want to see renewables great but actually what does that just transition look like for other communities and other workers actually what what does what does that mean for them how do we ensure that we don't treat all the communities and other workers like thatcher treated coal miners and actually give them longevity give them security give them investment the skills the training and job guarantees that they need and it felt like a real step towards that kind of conversation so just to say that i thought that was really important on the international side i mean now we rightly saw condemnation around what some countries were and were not willing to, to do at COP, particularly India and China. What I would say is that when we're looking at emissions, we cannot just look at the emissions of today, we need to understand how countries have contributed to historical emission trends. And that cannot be separated from the history of colonialism and slavery in the UK's role in that astronomical. And I think that leads on to a bigger conversation about what climate justice looks like, what climate reparations looks like, and what a palliative approach to climate justice should, should and, and, and can be um, if, if we take this seriously, which we should. Um, uh, and uh, on the point on, on debt, it was, it was raised earlier as well, <clears throat> there's things that we can do as, as a nation, I think, again, at a normative level, we don't have a, a seat around the table as such, but at a normative level, that can be really impactful in pushing for the type of change that we need to see just now. Countries need fiscal space to be able to see through just transitions and they don't have it at the moment because we have a system of debt accumulation and um, at, that actually you know, rewards and funds lines the pockets of um, the, the creditors and we have a narrative around debt that is one of irresponsible borrowing as opposed to irresponsible lending and that needs to change. One of the ways that we can change that is through the creation of an independent debt workout mechanism. Um, and, and the UK is a massive creditor nation as well. Um, and so the independent, an independent debt workout mechanism could assess whether debt should be restructured, whether it should be cancelled, whether we should provide debt relief. 
Um, and I think that would be a really important first step, and I would love to see um, Scotland uh, champion that. I, in my previous job, work for a watchdog to the International Monetary Fund and Borough Bank. Um, and the UK and, and Europe as a whole has a, a very influential seat around the table in both of those extraordinarily new colonial governance structures. Um, and those institutions are really interesting illustrations, I think, of where we're, where we're at. I say we in terms of um, wealthy northern um, states and the role that we play in the international sphere. And they're kind of masters of spin. Um, and so, you know, you'll see all women panels in Davos, isn't it wonderful? And a lot of talk about in inclusion and the inclusive economy and sustainable economy. And actually, if you look at the nature of those loan conditions in the case of the IMF, they are still rooted in austerity, they are still rooted in deregulation, they are still rooted in privatisation of public services and companies. And that is fundamentally misaligned with what we need to see to actually tackle the, tackle the climate and environmental crisis. So we need space for a just transition. And to do that means that we need to challenge the knee-jerk reaction to uh, economic crisis management. And actually tackle it at its source as well. Um, and, and just another thing to add on the international development front. One of the things that the World Bank has got really, really good at doing is um, utilising the language of sustainability to, to further um, deepen marketisation of economies. You do that through, through public private partnerships. Now we know that through PFI disasters. We have exported that model globally to low and middle income countries and they are now straddled with the contingent debt liabilities of them. And that's an energy infrastructure, schools, hospitals, you name it. And we've done that through institutions like the World Bank. Similarly, there's a now push to drive maximising financial development. That's about achieving the sustainable development goals. And what we are seeing is a real deepening of the role of asset management companies in that. Are BlackRock and Vanguard aligned with the type of value we want to see? I don't think so. So, you know, there's also a need to call out some of this bluff because there's a real concerted greenwashing effort from international financial institutions, and the UK has a seat at that table. And we should use our voice more effectively and actually call for the type of climate justice that we want to see. And last but not least, I just want to touch upon trade. So the UK's trading position is a little bit precarious just now. Um, but we have played a role both as, uh, as the UK and through the EU trading bloc in locking low and middle income countries into very extractive trading deals. Um, that actually exacerbate global power imbalances, but also lock them into decades of, of possible extraction as well. If we look at the EU, Mexico, modern free trade agreement, for example, that's a really good illustration of locking Mexico into decades of, um, of, of possible extraction, um, no doubt benefit European possible companies. Um, but so, you know, there's, it, it's not about tackling just one thing, it's about a systemic change, and to do that we need to, to rein in corporate power, we need to actually root the system in climate justice. Um, and, and tackle tackle it at a multi pronged level because there's a lot of wrong just now. Yeah. Yeah, so um, obviously there's such a huge long history and you know some great points there um, from the other speakers. But I suppose for me there's two principles about how we need to act globally. The first is first do no harm. Um, which kind of covers the things like debt. I mean, uh, I did a lot, um, my PhD was based on debt and David Graeber's debt for the uh, first 5,000 years, which everyone should read it, you can listen to it. There was like a BBC that split it up into a nice four-parter, um, if you prefer to listen to that sort of content. But, you know, debt is violence. Debt is power held over one person, one country, one group of people over another. It's a power from the haves over the have-nots. It actually sort of sits behind the entire way the global economy works. It sits behind our own situations, and behind that debt is violence, right? It, it is it is backed up by the state, by armies, by you know. The, the, it's really just hiding beneath the, the sort of surface, and you know, I had some great sort of suggestions about about ways that we might get through that. But also remember, there was a lot of debt cancellation. Um, with the debt jubilee, um, you know, um, I can't even remember how long ago that was. Um, you know, in, in, certainly in the last sort of 20 years, 
but that wasn't full debt cancellation, so they cancelled enough debt that the rest of the debt was payable, and so it would become the debt would become sustainable in, in that sort of language. And, and actually, when we are facing this crisis and we have got these historic emissions, I think there is a really clear sort of story there to tell um, about you know debt cancellation being one of the ways, one of the things that we owe these countries. Not everything we always can get, but it is certainly that debt is in the wheel. And um, so that, you know, first do no harm in that. That goes with trade agreements. And um, so, you know, even back when I was, I was doing my, my undergrad and my master's again, some new uh, little time ago, and um, probably in the last 20 years, um, that, you know, the, the stats were just absolutely staggering. You know, like the, the, the post colonial British, col like the, the ex British colonies, were largely stuck in exactly the same patterns of production that they were in when we had the power and we owned those countries. So we we, we sort of you know decolonized, but we kept everything pretty much the same. But we didn't have the responsibilities if we had any, arguably, there in the first place. So there's that first do no harm in terms of debt, in terms of trade, in terms of how we interact with one another. That's kind of the, the negative part of the story. The positive part of that is um, is about listening and learning. So the other part of colonialization for me is this feeling that we in the West know better, that, 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 that the story we are told is that you know the global south have to catch up to us, right? We are making an absolute catch of it. Like we are one of the richest countries in the world, and we've got sixty percent of people in this country this year are going to struggle to pay their energy bills and have to you know make real difficult choices that are going to get into more debt. And we are not doing this well. We are not model to follow. What that means is we have to listen and learn from countries who've been operating under great pressure for a long time, you know, often through you know, our fault in the first place. But we have to learn, we have to collaborate and actually not see it as this kind of master-servant relationship and see this as, you know, we are going to need to adapt. So climate adaptation is a big, big thing that we're not talking about. Like we have to try and reduce our emissions, but we have locked in a certain amount of warming and we need to adapt to that here. What can we learn from Africa, which is you know, you know, much closer to the equator than we are, that is a lot more hotter place than we are? What can we learn? How can we put money into research and development in, you know, in, in Africa, in the global south, in hotter countries, that they can sell those products and those ideas back to us? You know, like how how can we kind of be smart about how we spend money, about how we kind of you know t take that sort of forward and. Just the final point on, on that bit is, you know, the policy design guide that um, the really was talking about is really embedding that into, into we all. So it really is like, what can we learn about countries and, and countries from right across the globe about how they've got good democracies, about how they've made good decisions that are based and rooted in communities. So really trying to learn from um, everybody sort of across the world and sort of share and innovate and collaborate together. And I think that's that's hugely important. And um, actually, in one of those design guide sessions, in terms of what should we measure, which I think is a great question, and um, I I would say we have to resist any single measure of progress. I think the problem with GDP is there's lots, but it's a single measure of progress. So somehow you're mashing together sort of you know a lot of different categories and giving yourself a number. Right, there are some approaches, and again, it's a diversity of approaches, so fair play to people who want to go down that route, but it's not my preferred opinion, because if you end up with a number and you've got a seven, are you happier than you if you got a five? Like, what does that mean in terms of well-being in a really substantive, real sense to people? I think, I think it's, it's smart to measure the things we already do measure, child poverty, how much money people have, whether people can get housing, how many homeless people have, you know, Things like that are real things, but you're not collapsing something as complex as human, well-lived lives. Uh, you know, so I, I think we can use measures, but then also just burn them because that, 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 that's not the real lived experience. But we need to use smart um, measures to guide our policy making and to guide our kind of conversations with one another and understand where change needs to happen. Um, and in Scotland, we do have the National Performance Framework, and in that, in the Wellbeing Policy Guide Development, 
um, that was talked about quite a bit as one of the examples, but it's not really, it's a great example of how you can have a load of measures that, are, that is really kind of putting more of a well-being economy lens on it. But I think it's safe to say, and Paul, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not really used um, enough. It's, you know, it's not, you know, uh, that design guide gives a few businesses, um, and they were saying, you know, an, an organisation said, we'd love to show the government how we're fitting into this, but it's not necessarily part of the metrics of how you would, you know, get procurement, it's not necessarily part of the metrics of how funding gets allocated and budgets get allocated. So I think there's a really good, you know, world-leading example there, but we have to now make it real and make it guide decision-making and make it guide policy a little bit more. Just on that point, I think that's important. The, there's a well-being economy monitor framework being put together at the moment, and I know there have been some discussions uh, and in regards to that, and then with the national funds framework, but it has to be more than, you know, it has to go to other people, and, and, yeah. and again, it depends on what indicators are. I kind of want to move on to the, to the next part of this, and we've got an hour into it, but I have an hour later, and I see the lady with a request, and I'll bring you in just in a little second, if that's okay. I think we've seen how important national policy is, we've talked about how incredibly important Global policies. I want to talk I'm talking about now. I'll bring the lady in just another second, and the mm -hmm. folks give a heads up to the to the panel. It's, it's the role of local communities, it's the role of local government, and it's the role of the voluntary sector. How do we move them towards the building? And we do they understand it? What's the role of them? How do we move that? Because it has to be across all sectors. I'm going to ask people if they have any questions on, particularly on that, on local community, communities, um, on on a local government and voluntary sector. But I'm going to bring the lady in because we have hand up last time. Hello, um, so climate emergency and cost of living crisis come hand in hand, which is something that's been spoken about this whole thing. Um, climate emergency has um, had young people working from the forefront, the likes of Greta Thunberg on a national um, scale, but also young people in Scotland that dedicate their time to Friday for Futures protests. Um, emergency, cost of living, emergency and cost of living crisis, all these words are great, but they've lost their meaning. I don't see decision makers treating it as a crisis or an emergency. I appreciate things take their time, um, but when is too long? Are we already there? Is it too late? And just for clarification, before I ask my question, um, when I speak about young people, I mean people aged 11 to 25, do you think that young people are listened to and taken seriously? Are our voices heard specifically in climate and the cost of living crisis? I think it's fair to say that the actions made by decision makers right now are going to affect myself and my friends and my generation's future. Young people's voices are so important that they cannot be ignored. What I'm going to do is ask the panel, obviously, you mentioned that in the book, the question there, I'm going to ask you if they can, that can be brought into the to reply to the question uh, in terms of that. John, I know you see your hand up there just in terms of. John, John's a provost at East Holden Council, John and I know each other really well, so John, thank great you. to see you again. Oh, thank you, thank you for the invite. And just, just to my um, fellow audience member here, I hope as a, as a local councillor, I think you would say this is a, a local. MSP, and I know Glenn, who is the leader of the SNP group, I'm an East Lothian and a Labour member, is that we would hope that we're listening and, and we can all listen better and we can all communicate better. I, I have a worry, and, and it's around talk about systems and systems need behaviour and culture. I think there are lots of strong learning points. I'm 17, so I'm at the other end, and, and I'm not sorry about that because I think. In the 70 years that I've lived, I've seen improvement and I've seen deterioration. I've looked through the NHS setting up, I've looked through better education, different system of going to university and so on. So there are lessons in the past. So I don't want to be all that critical. But if we go through change, we go through a transition. And that donut economy, the life belt economy, about being safe and just. Gemma, your point about those who are least able to help themselves. My worry is about that transition when economically we do need to create value. And it is interesting on the environment as well when we talk about EDF and France, mostly driven by nuclear, so there are, there are dilemmas for all of us in this. So, so my question, having had a wee speech, and thank you Paul, is, is, um, is, is just about the transition into a well-being economy, which I support, but the fear of 
that communicating with those who are most affected now, potentially being even more damaged, less safe, and being less justly treated. And I wonder if you'd thought that through. Okay, I'm going to say another 200 just now. So I, I, I would relate to the local community because it, we'll still have a question for an opportunity beyond this part of it. I don't know if, I'm, I'm keen to focus on local communities and local local authorities at the moment. If not, I, I'll still take you, but I, I just want the panel to answer that point of view. So I don't know if the lady at the back is about. I said it was about. Right, I, I, will, I, I will come back to you. I don't know if the lady if it's about local communities and local authorities, and again, I will come back to you. I just want, I'm keen for the panel to address the local communities and local authorities point of view. Hello, thank you. I just uh, have a small confusion. We are trying to match uh, two things. One is their well-being. Another is uh, the economy. Well-being is an inner status, which is natural inner status of being, which can be physical to psychological to social. Whereas economy is totally man-made. We are these two are basically controversial things. How are we going to match this? Thing? This is my basic confusion. Another thing is, we, are, we have been talking about the spatial differences in different countries, different places, within the countries, the differences. But there is also a temporal component. I mean, we are talking about the solution for a well-being economy. Is it for the present community or is it for the next generation? Is it for the next uh, 10 generations? What is the condition of the posterity? We, we, we say that there is a uh, certain community which is, a, which is able to pay for its energy bills comfortably, will they be able to pay the energy bills after 10 generations? Because do we have the resources to meet those? Then the sustainability of all these identity questions, all the solutions, all the resources is a question mark which we need to address. Keep it keep at the back of our mind if we need to be proactive for a longer generation. Thank you. I think it's just a I don't know whether it is a question or a comment. No, no, I, I, yeah. I'm gonna, I, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you back in. And I think, I think I'm keen to the panel talking about the role of local communities, the role of local government. And, and I think the point that's been mentioned, I think, by the last two speakers in terms of the transition, we're not gonna, it's not going to happen overnight. How do we manage that transition about from where we are? There is, I don't think there's any disagreement about the urgency to move that one as quick as possible. So it's talking about the roles of local communities, local authorities, the voluntary sector, for example. How do we manage that transition? What do we need to do until we move towards a more with that, I suppose, more balanced way of being fun. Um, totally, I'll probably come to yourself first of all. Obviously, you talked about the, the Makers Valley in terms of the, the partnership you've got going on there, so I think there's, there's lessons that we can learn from what you've done in, in Johannesburg. So come to yourself and then, and then Jayla and then Mary. Okay. Yeah, so the, the Makers Valley is just an incredible community, and I think we, we start with a question in our community because you know, we're not stuck on the word well-being economy. I think it's the values and the principles that we're speaking about and what we, the, you know, what is the ends to all of this? What is the ends to the economy is the well-being of people and planet. And so when we speak to a local community who has no idea what the well-being economy is, we ask the question, what is a good life? And then we say, ready. And we ask, we say, come up, ready. And really kind of, reflect on that at a community level because of globali globalization and westernization and you know american media <clears throat> if we just ask what we would like you know the <laughs> the narrative there or the response there can be really um just material things a lot of the time but when we ask the word really at a local level and asking people in our community what does good life mean really to you at a deeper level then we start to see the things that we're speaking about here yeah, around the well-being economy in terms of justice, in terms of a healthy planet, in terms of being able to eat and having a living wage where you can afford to have the basic goods or a dignified life. So those are the responses that we see at an inherent level, and it doesn't matter who we ask at a, at a community level, the responses at a deeper level start to become the things that we're speaking about which is amazing. And I think when you have a workshop like that or a dialogue like that, and we start to get to that level, it's such a beautiful moment and a connection moment to say, actually, this is what we're working towards as a community. We're not just working for material <clears throat> well-being, but there are other things that we're working towards as well. And what then do we, how do we get to this question? And so 
What we're really passionate about is saying we're not just putting the solutions out there. We are actually asking the questions from our community, allowing them to have the voice because we believe that they, the experts in the daily struggles that they are facing every single day, they are the ones that are most aware of what this reality looks like. So somebody in their local government office or administration like boardroom doesn't really understand what's happening at a local level. And so we really passionate about this multi-level, we spoke about public-private partnerships, <clears throat> not just at a face level, but actually what does this mean at a local level. And so some of the things that have come up from this is really looking at local businesses, um, looking at circular economy practices in terms of production, in terms of how we're connecting at a local level, in terms of social enterprise, I think it's such a great easy and understandable way to think about your business differently, about the jobs you're creating within that business and how you're going to be able to create fair employment. And so these are practical ways that we engage at a local level. And I think this, this thing of partnerships is really important. And um, we were awarded this thing of a network of possibility in this crisis because it was partners coming together. <clears throat> and I think power dynamics exist in the world, and this is when it becomes difficult when you're speaking about transitions. <laughs> the power dynamics and the egos and the, <clears throat> you know, the, the historic kind of wealth um, coming into play is how do we address that at a, at a room where we are all eye to eye and we really address the power dynamics. And so when you're speaking about well-being on an individual level and well-being at a societal level, I think the two go hand in hand. You can't extract one from the other because they impact one another. And so it's really important that we have facilitative practices in order to engage the community on a really meaningful way. And I know it sounds fluffy what I'm saying, but you know, we speak about getting to your answers fast and quickly. But from an African perspective, it's also so important to, to have healing from the colonization that's taken place in the past or apartheid practices that have happened. There's a lot of deeper things that need to take place in order for solutions to just come to the table. And so I'm not saying that, you know, the dialogue, the dialogue has to be followed by action, but the, the, the dialogue is very necessary. <clears throat> and we speak about this term, I think it's a UK term, so it's not a South African term, um, around new municipalism. And because a lot of our governments in South Africa, you know, corrupt, uh, failing us in many, many ways, the, the local communities have also had to actually have their own active participation in citizenship. And what does that look like? Well, they're addressing a lot of the social and environmental ills through social enterprise, through NGOs, through co-ops. And this is what we see as new municipalism, is actually participatory budgeting happening at a local level, but people saying we are going to be active participants. And I think there's a sense of ownership that comes with that, is that we are seeing the impact of what we contribute to this community. So it's not just being beneficiaries, and we're really trying to steer away from that language of this non-profit or country coming as a savior to solve the issues of the community, actually, how do we enable the local knowledge to flourish and for them to have a sense of ownership and say, hey, we know the answers. It's, it's, we speak about asset-based community development. This is really when we see kind of our answers coming to the table. And then there's really a sense of investment in terms of making those ideas work. And it becomes more sustainable because it's not just, oh, I'm just going to receive my grant and go. We say it has to be a combination of government relief, but also active participation from the ground up. Um, so yeah, I would say this is kind of what's happening in Jamaica's Valley and the local things that are happening. We're working a lot with property developers. The ULI, the Urban Land Institute, actually a European organization, awarded us with this concept, which is quite controversial, around gentrification without displacement and what does that even mean. <laughs> is about improving standards, increasing well-being in an area without making the, the local residents leave because property prices are increasing. And so that's been such an interesting thing as well, is that how do we partner and make sure that the, the private sector 
organizations see the benefits. It's not just about the commercial value, but the social value that this type of work brings impacts and actually enhances the commercial value as well. So that's kind of what's happening, and I know it looks like all out there. <laughs> We will see your passion for the project when it comes. <laughs> <laughs> Gemma, and then uh, I mean, wow, what a set of questions. Um, we, we could have just started with daughters and then we could keep on for the next five hours. Um, on the wellbeing economy, so the, the your very first question there, so it's something that we, we try and, which we obviously haven't so far tonight, try and be quite clear that, you know, there's, there's, there's well-being in the sort of feeling good sense, which is very crucial and it is part of it further down the line, but when we talk about well-being economy, we mean that kind of systems change to enable probably those inner things, but there is a difference between the kind of, hey, why don't you, are you stressed? Like, I used to work for universities, and that they wouldn't pay you, they'd have you on a precarious contract. Um, and they'd be like, would you like to come to a seminar about stress? I'd do some free yoga. I'm like, give me a contract. I'm teaching 140 students like political economy for a week, you know, like for a term. Give me a contract instead of paying me by the hour. Um, but they'd say, go to yoga. So it's trying to get into that more systemic, more systemic sort of groups of how what an economy should be aimed at. But I totally agree with the be like that it's not about the terms, who cares if people use that term or not, it's just a way to bring those discussions about the economy being pointed at and aimed at something else, um, you know, so I would definitely say with that. Um, the temporal quality question, fantastic, there's also a geographical quality question, there's a positionality sort of question in that, and you know, don't have a nice neat answer for you because that question is fundamentally like a deep philosophical question about the human condition, what it means to be on earth, what our legacy are. I really love, um, I forgot his last name, Roman, it, Kate, Kate Raworth's husband, who's written a book called The Good Ancestors, so Kate Raworth and the donut that you can know to say. They, they must have a fascinating kitchen table discussion. <laughs> um, and, and, and it's this idea of, you know, that being the good ancestor, which is thinking seven generations ahead. Um, and I think that that's really important, but then the question here from one of my local councillors, because I'm an East Lillian girl now, um, you know, is that, that, don't, don't get me wrong, I absolutely love it. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but is, that's also, that's the same question, because it's about who is served when and how, and it, and it ties into what Philip Wheeler was saying about power. So at the minute in the current system, what I would sort of push back a little bit on the, the sort of way your question was going was that actually the most vulnerable are the ones least served by this current system. So moving to something else is what we have to do to protect, not protect those people, because that, again, that sounds like sort of patriarchal kind of thing, but is to make sure that the economy that we are building that exists now already in this current moment. So this is this is something that we have to think about. There isn't one dominant economy that is everywhere and every place all of the time. There are lots and lots of different economies. The way we care for each other, like in COVID, there was a big care economy where the neighbors were looking out for each other. You know, we ran a mutual aid group in a local area and get food parcels to people. You know, the councils were, were taking care of people with no, re, you know, with no recourse to, we must make profit out of this, with no recourse to, well, you know, um, is this gonna have good return? Like there are lots and lots of different forms of the economy, some of which, are here and exist in the present, and what we need to do is notice them. We need to grow them, but we need to, to speak about them, to recognize them. Um, and the things that are bad and that are harming us, we need to call that out, and we need to say, you've had your day, and actually we need to help maybe have a just transition, so thinking about Aberdeen, thinking about all those communities. And um, you know, the Northeast has never recovered from the reforms in the, the 1980s and you know the decimation of the Northeast. It's never recovered. And we don't want that in Scotland, we don't want that with communities and people. But these people also have a huge wealth of expertise. They have the skills we need to do the transition. So it's about managing that wealth, putting the investment in the right places to take them with us. Um, and then I'm coming to the young people question. And I love that you put an age on it. Um, I want, by the way, before I wasn't trying to insinuate I'm still a young person. Definitely in the past. Um, but I, you know, um, 
we had a campaign at COP, um, and we had T-shirts printed out, and it was, you'll be dead in 2050. And yeah, it sounds a bit rude, sounds a bit, you know, but it was that point of, you're making these decisions, and you're not going to face the consequences of this. And you know, that's what I was saying, probably when you were a toddler, or even not born yet, because it's that terrifying. Um, but you know, it's the same problem, and I think no young people are not listened to, but also I don't think young people should be listened to. I think young people should have power to make decisions. And I think what I learned at COP was the global youth were very much invited in. We were invited in. We were allowed to speak to the, you know, to the teams. Who was, you know, and they were all brilliant, well-meaning people who wanted to get a good deal for the environment. But when COP started to get a bit shaky, they just kicked us all out. We had no actual power, no actual role, other than a kind of greenwashed kind of, oh, maybe nice to the young kids kind of thing. And so I think there's often either just platitudes for young people, or um, you know, you've got to put your money where your mouth is. So I've seen some good examples of participatory budgeting, where they give the budget to the young people in areas, and they decide themselves how to do it. More of that, please, more of that. But also, Councillors behind you, ask them, how do you stand? How do you become a councillor in your local area? Like, we need to rejuvenate local politics. There is a lot of power and there's a lot of um, innovation in local politics with this new, new municipalism. You know, North Ayrshire, as I mean, hopefully get on to, has got some, got some fantastic um, approaches to you know, community wealth building and things like that. And then you wanted me to talk about the local build, so um, finally, just Behind my local councillors, because Dunbar is such an amazing place. Sorry, Philip. There's Philip, and Philip um, works for an organisation. Well, he volunteers, uh, you know, as a leader in uh, an organisation called Sustaining Dunbar. Sustaining Dunbar have set up a community orchard. They've set up a community bakery. They've set up a community grocery. They're looking at community energy, thinking about retrofitting, thinking about continually pushing the boundaries. You know, they didn't start with power, with a budget, with wealth. It was a group of people who got together and said, we want to do something different. That's, that economy is there, that, that group of people is there, and that's the, they're the things we need to build and kind of move locally. And I know, you know, um, we've just been talking about, we need to meet because I want to know what your plans are. Like, you know, and, and I know you're looking at um, local retrofitting programs, bringing in, you know, so, there's so much we can achieve locally, and um, so keeping that global might and that act, act local think global thing, but actually, but it's really taking that power and really running something. And yeah, let's have just more young people just actually just making the decisions and having the power, not listening to them, but well, do listen to them. So, <laughs> like, let's just like you make good decisions as well. Like that, that's what it's about. No, I think that's very important and just to support the point of view. But I also stay in Dunbar, so it's not Dunbar takeover, I promise you. <laughs> but Philip is looking at Philip Rebel, who's behind there, and, and I know Philip from the Likeness. He was looking at this 15 years ago and took this issue, so a big massive thanks to Philip for what he's done. So, we need more to follow up. Then, we'll make a point yourself in conscious time, and I won't bring the chap in who did the question here, so we will we'll do that. No, I will bring it. So, I mean, obviously, we talked to him about the North Asia and the community wealth building. Um, I don't know if you just want to touch on now, any other points you've got talking in about the role of local authorities and the yeah, absolutely. So I've been lucky enough to sit on the expert panel for an Affairs Just Community Wealth Building project. Community wealth building um, goes absolutely hand in hand with match made in heaven with the wellbeing economy. Um, and, uh, and it's the first community wealth building programme in Scotland. Community wealth building is about a transfer of physical and financial assets to local communities and local economies. It's about pluralising businesses, local businesses, and that they're actually rooted in the life of the local economies, they're giving back local economies. It's about fair work, it's about land, it's about procurement of forum to ensure that we can create dense systems of um, local supply chains. And importantly as well, it has a different idea of what success looks like too. It's about the creation of how many living wage jobs we have, um, or you know how much inward investment there was for local procurement to pluralist businesses, for example. And so, um, you know, it provides a kind of stark contrast to the, the notions of kind of what success might look like. You know, I always compare it to like an Amazon warehouse where, you know, we had folks sleeping in tents outside one of the Amazon warehouses in Scotland. They were being paid below, I believe, the national minimum wage. Um, at, but on paper, that's inward investment and that's local job creation. What's that to look for anyone? What's that to come back to anyone? It's extraction. 
and then we need to get ourselves right out of that situation where we have a strong man argument with this, but it's nothing. Um, because it's not, and actually we're really well placed. It's part of a genuine just transition, it's part of a genuine green industrial strategy to actually create the type of good green jobs we want to see, to actually create sustainable <coughs> in their investment in local economies, and to actually enable those local businesses, pluralist businesses, worker owned businesses, social enterprises, community businesses to thrive. Um, and to do that, we can't, we can't just talk about it from the ground up. We also need to talk about tackling some of, the, some of that stuff at the top. For the same reason that we can't talk, just talk about why people are poor without understanding why people are so rich just now. And we need to talk about those hand in hand. They go together. And so for community wealth building, um, I just want to give an example on energy just now. Now, obviously, what we've seen recently um, is eye-watering. So if we look at the Shells, Shell had nearly £10 billion in earnings in the first quarter of this year alone. Um, Centrica, they're the owner of British Gas, um, their operating profits were £1.3 billion in the first half, half of this year. And meanwhile, we've seen the rates of folk in the UK um, living in food and fuel poverty triple throughout the last year, and that's before the October price increase comes in. So this is a dire state of events. Now, I want to be clear that community wealth building is not about placing the role of the state. It's not about a David Cameron big society nonsense. It's about actually ensuring that we're creating physical and financial transfers of assets to local economies and local communities and putting more power in their hands. Um, and, and so for uh, North Ayrshire, just touching upon energy because it's so integral to the cost of living crisis. Um, as I mentioned before, the record profits of the Big Six, of Shell, of Seneca, the list could go on. Um, now, in North Ayrshire, what they've done, um, North Ayrshire has very high levels, as, as a lot of coastal industrial areas do, of delicate land. Um, and so what they've done is the council have, or they've got planning permission to, to build wind and solar farms that are council owned, public hands. Um, in, in that derelict land. If that's successful, it's going to create 277% of the council's energy needs. 277% of the council's energy needs. Meaning they can sell that back to the national grid, get money back for that, and reinvest that in the local economy and local community. That could go into channeling fuel poverty um, reduction in North Ayrshire. That to me is common sense. Is that not a common sense approach to this? And that's not how it's normally done. And so it's really about rewiring local economies and community wealth building is about local economic systems change. It's about that rewiring local economies. And I want to give another example as well. And we've seen a real upsurge and it's, it, it's absolutely brilliant throughout Scotland with community owned uh, energy projects. And there was an example, I did a paper with a Scottish economist, Laurie McFarlane, on a community wealth building approach to just transition to, to land. Um, and one of the examples we looked at was a single turbine in the Highlands, which is predicted to have surplus generation of 4.4 million um, uh, uh, after operating financing costs are, are taken into consideration. Again, if we look at you know, how, much, how many wind, windmills would Shell and BP have to build before 4.4 million went back into the hands of communities? So it's really about flipping a lot of this on its head, right? Um, and I also want to touch upon transport as well um, as community wealth building. So I think we've taken an incredible step in the right direction in the National Island of Scotland. The idea that our you know, very high rail fares were being channeled into the pocket for shareholders and also owned by the Dutch National Government's railways, by the way, that we bought, um, was illogical in my eyes and I think it's an absolutely brilliant step in the right direction that we've nationalised Scotland. Buses, on the other hand. Um, Arriva, first route, stagecoach, go ahead, National Express, paid out an average of nearly £150 million a year to their shareholders between 2008 and 2018. Many of them are occupational in Scotland. Um, and if we look at the good city of Edinburgh, for example, where we have uh, a council run bus service, um, and Nottingham as well, there's a few examples throughout the UK. What we tend to find is that they have better wages, is that they have lower fares, is that they actually function a lot better. Um, and I say this as someone who's just moved from London to Glasgow and I'm very frustrated with the buses. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I also want to, uh, to look at land as well as, as, well as community and energy. So just now in Scotland we've got a bit of a perfect storm with, with land and it, and it ties so directly into the, the need for the just transition as well. On the point on the just transition,
transition that was raised earlier. I think what we're getting at here is the difference between net zero as a standalone goal and a just transition. You can, you know, there was fantastic work, um, econometric work carried out by transition economics that showed that actually Scotland could go to net zero without actually creating that many jobs, without actually, you know, transforming communities, and without actually, you know, delivering the necessary policy levers and levels of investment to um, secure a sustainable future for oil communities just now. Or, we could have a just transition. In my eyes, that needs to be worker-led, that needs to be trade unions around the table, that needs to be actually about um, delivering the right levels of, of investment, regulatory reform, policy levers to actually secure a just transition that creates millions of good green unionised jobs to lengthen the for the country and rapidly decarbonises the economy. Again, a, a no-brainer for me. Um, on land just now, Scotland has, and we've made incredible headway to tackle this, um, particularly over the last few years, still has a very heavily concentrated land ownership, particularly in, in rural Scotland. Um, it also has a very unregulated land market and it has very favourable subsidies and uh, tax reliefs for those seeking to green the land. And now on paper, greening land looks good and of course greening land is good, but how we do so matters. And this ties into the net zero versus just transition approach because Scotland has become an international hub for um, carbon markets. And so what we're finding actually is often you know, asset management firms, big corporations, um, are, are buying up a lot of land to plant trees or peatland restoration um, is still absentee landowners often um, and actually what are the benefits there for communities? Now if we look to actually democratise nature restoration, we can actually deliver good green local jobs, we can actually see benefits back to communities um, and actually start to regulate the land market in a way that actually actively gears it towards that. Um, Last but not no means least, just to say on the point on young people and the most local authorities and about to cheat, but rent. Um, a two bedroom house on average in Edinburgh is £1,700 a month. Um, Edinburgh city centre has uh, around 2,700 active Airbnb listings. Um, that is driving up rent, that is fueling homelessness. Um, and that is creating housing insecurity that disproportionately affects young people. So if we are looking for measures for what we can do to actually help create um, some security for young people, we need rent controls in the long run. We've seen, we've seen measures taken towards this. We need to see that implemented. In the immediate term, we need a rent freeze. And the idea that rents are going up while people cannot afford to keep their homes or put food on the table is nonsense. We need an immediate rent freeze just now. This is a national crisis and we need to deal with it with the urgency that it deserves. And it's disproportionately, that's disproportionately affecting young people. Um, and secondly, again, last, I promise. <laughs> Retro <laughs> um, retrofitting homes. We've seen progress in this in Scotland, we need to turbocharge that. Retro, a national retrofitting programme in Scotland creates good green jobs in every single constituency throughout the country. It rapidly reduces fuel poverty at a time of national crisis and it rapidly reduces emissions in every single part of the country. And so that again would be a really good step in the right direction to tackle the possibility crisis. I'm conscious of the motive that I have a six on and we're looking just to bring the question in and I'm going to ask each of the panelists to bring in an important point. So I'm really sorry, but you know, I think it was there. So if you want to use a question, and if everybody's okay with that, I'll bring it to an end in about five minutes or so. So if you want to ask a question, then I'll ask the panelists to address the point and also what their final takeaway from this is. Okay, so I'm going to finish off the event for you then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really appreciate being able to ask the question. It, it almost seems uh, that most of it's been answered, which is quite nice, but there is maybe a way to uh, sort of make it more about the question and the answer. So I'm going to ask the panelists to come up to to, to, to round it off in a way, so there's about five questions all wrapped into one. I think it's about narratives for really. We've heard like lots of really useful solutions to how we can move to a well-being economy. But I still get stuck to hearing people down my local pub in Leith where rents are also terrible and getting worse. Uh, hearing people talk about money and value, that the word that John used, in a way that it it doesn't work for the future that we're imagining. How do we move that narrative in average Joe Boggs in the pub away from this idea that money in their pocket is linked to 
the need to have shareholders like their pockets from big, 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 big corporates. I can't see that narrative clearly in my head, even though I know I'm with you and all the answers that you've shown today. Uh, so thanks. Thanks for calling me. No, thanks. thanks. And I think just to, to address the, to that point, I think I'll, I'll ask colleagues to address that point you've made, because I think that's an entirely important part of the meeting. If that's possible, and I want to take away and address the point that you mentioned, which I think is incredibly important. How do we, how do we normalise this? We've talked about today, but how does it get in the local community? How does the wellbeing economy people see it as, as an actual impact on their lives? So, Tom, I'm going to come to yourself, and then I'll come to Miriam, and then I'll ask you to take this. And we'll give it to the next seconds if possible. I know it's a bit of a challenge, but if we can. Yeah, that is a challenge. I love narratives and I'm, I come from the advertising and marketing world where this is so important. Obviously, I left because of the, <laughs> the negative impacts. But the, the, the stance that we have is at the Wellbeing Economy Alliance is bold, vital, and entirely possible. And I think I love that because we, we come into this conversation with a positive kind of mindset in terms of we can, it's not something that's just like too hard to figure out, we know this is a wicked problem, but we can think of solutions together. And I love the fact of bringing the ordinary Joe, what the term that you used, to the conversation. So these conversations, these platforms, these dialogues need to be in different spaces. It needs to be in the spaces, in the pubs, wherever it is, where people are, where they, you know, let's have the conversations there. So COP26, there was a Common Ground Music Festival and the Wellbeing Economy Alliance was there speaking about economic systems change at a music festival, which was absolutely incredible. And using the power of graphic design, videography, podcasting, and social media, you know, we say, like even though it's not what we want to advocate, but we really want to use the good that comes from social media in terms of talking about this in the ordinary world and the places where normal people congregate. And these channels are really important for us. And using um, topics that are, are quite vital at the moment, speaking about inflation, so our social media team are going to do a narrative around that and we'll post it next week around this is something that's really, really at the heart of normal people at the moment and how do they see inflation linked to a wellbeing economy and what is the narrative around that in simple, easy to understand language that's not academic, that's not on a paper, but really just tangible and, and easy to reach, accessible. Um, so, yeah, that's my 90 seconds. Thank you, Dylan. Yeah, um, so I am a uh, master policy nerd and I'm always getting called out for speaking in jargon, rightly so. Um, however, I will say a, a couple of things. So I think when I worked at, I, I was working at a think tank and one of the things that we noticed basically was that you know, there's a massive limitation to how many people are going to read a 30 page report. Even though I love 30 page reports. <laughs> and so, and actually what we ended up doing instead was making loads of videos of doing social media infographics or doing webinars instead and posting those on our page. And actually I think it's about like finding those different channels of communication and to actually reach different audiences and the way that you speak and the way that you frame things, depending on who that target audience is, needs to completely shift. Um, and so, uh, the other thing I'd say, you know, that not everybody's going to understand what community wealth building or wellbeing economy alliance or whatever these economic systems change um, is because not everybody exists in, in, in that um, field of work. I don't think it's, you know, people will understand that the economy is not working for folk. And I think there's a way in which we can put that across um, to actually speak to them in that way, to understand that they're being hard done by here um, and that other, and that, that there's people laughing at them at the top. And there was a, a report that I worked on, it is a report, but it, it's not long, I promise. Um, it's called Framing the Economy, um, and it was many months ago now, um, I think it was 2015 or 16. Um, and it was with a group called the New Economic uh, New Economy Organisers Network, NEON, um, and it's called Framing the Economy. And it actually does huge amounts of, of testing of what frames work for folk and what does just not work at all. And it gives loads of concrete ideas for what we can say instead when we're talking about climate change, when we're talking about economic crises. 
Um, uh, and, and I think that, that's been, that's I think a really helpful document to, to um, encourage a shift in that. Um, yeah. Just delete in and talk about framing me. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I was just like straight away, I was like. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so I think the biggest enemy of progress is the magnetism of the status quo. It is so easy to think of what currently is, is the natural order of things. That this is how things happen and anything from that is radical or an aberration. I think what we're living through at the moment and what we're going to go through in the next few years particularly is the awakening that what we're living in, that economic system is extraordinarily radical it pushes people to the extremes. Like, you know, I, I remember a few years back, um, and my, my son was really small, he was, I think he was about two, um, and there was that photo of that little boy, Elon Curzi, and he washed up on the shore. He was, he was face down, like lying there with a little pair of red shorts on. And we have not moved since that moment. That is horrific, that is absolutely horrific. And the current political narrative is turn them back in the boats, send them home, let them drown, prosecuting people for rescuing human beings. And, you know, we should be outraged at the way that the world is currently structured. And we need to be, you know, unequivocal in, in really fighting for something different. And in terms of narratives, everyone saw that that was horrific. There was a moment where that cut through, but it's brief and it's fleeting when it happens. And what we're going through now, we need to use this moment well. And your question is a fantastic one. But I think it's, I always, because I'm a wonky academic as well, I always want to explain the problem and go back. Let me sit and give you a lecture on how we're going to, Actually, we need to stop doing that so much. We need to just say, this is the common sense solution to this. And you know, good homes, good jobs, good lives, that's what we need to do. Scrap the, 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 the way that our imaginations of what's currently possible is trapping us into the lives that we're struggling to live. And let's really just ask questions, be bold, and we need to ask it ourselves, is it enough? You come home from work, you're tired, you could, you know, once the kids are in bed, like I've got my mind on now. And like I'm just absolutely exhausted, but you've got to somehow keep pushing on and forwards. And it is possible, um, and we need to be bold with it because people are suffering and dying. But there is another way. So let's get these uh, this group of young people here, let's get them empowered. Uh, not means that it doesn't mean that it's all up to you because that's the other thing you hate about young people. But you know uh, that, that people treat young people as like we'll just kind of we'll mess it up and we'll just let you fix it a bit later. So, but let's get get those people in into power um, and let's start where people are. So the, the final point on that is we all were we reached out to sort of a, was it through the pandemic and I know there's been work going on working with the Scottish Football Association. So we want narratives. The Scottish Football Association want to talk about a well-being economy. They want to talk about how they are centred in communities all across Scotland. They are vital parts of the community, of the children, of the young people, of the parents who are coaches. Like, this isn't and shouldn't be just an academic exercise from the policy wonky stuff at the top. This has got to be about how people live their lives and why sport is critical and why, you know, these centres of places are good places to start conversations about where people are and what needs to happen. So everything's there, but just reject the status quo just wherever you can. <laughs> just push for something more humane and brilliant. I just want to close with a, a, few, a few thoughts more. One of us, we talked about the importance of, of the you know, global, global change, and I think that's really important. We talked about Scottish government asks, but we talked about it, obviously the, the, the feed through into the local authorities and to the end to local communities and then the importance of that. I just want to say three thanks, and I thank Scotland and the National Development Alliance and we'll be we, 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 we all Scotland for joining the, the club in this event. It's been fantastic, so many thanks to them. <laughs> I'm sure we can be sitting here at 9 o'clock, but we'll continue to get as well. So, we can be sitting here and dip in with a 
a massive thanks to the panelists. I think this has been a really a big discussion. <laughs> Thank you and I hope you enjoyed the event today. Thank you.